A large number of my patients with autoimmune diseases, at least initially, react to almost all forms of dairy and Mm -hmm. egg white and egg yolk. And that surprised me. Um, But it was there and staring me in the face. And so, and I talk about it and gut check. Look, if you've got an autoimmune disease, for now, uh, give up all forms of dairy and give up eggs. Uh, And that's something that's changed with me. Now, for most people, we can get it back to them. Fermented dairy, actually casein, which is one of the trouble-making proteins in dairy, is broken down with fermentation and makes it a more favorable form. So when we add dairy back into people, we add usually sheep and goat cheeses back or sheep and goat yogurts back. Um, so, But dairy was a surprise to me about how many people react to it. The other thing, I'll tell you actually a humorous story. Um, in my, my practice, our initial food recommendations, we didn't allow people to have almonds because a lot of my patients, particularly with rheumatoid arthritis, um, almonds were a trigger for them. They noticed that their joints hurt when they ate almonds. And so almonds were banned from the original list. And when I, when my editors with The Plant Paradox said, look, you are a really mean, mean nasty guy. You've taken all these things away from people. They can't have peanuts. They can't have cashews. Come on, throw us a bone. And I said, well, look, the almonds in general, the peel has the lectins. So if you have blanched almonds or if you have Marcona almonds or if you have almond flour, it'll probably be okay. And then we say, oh, okay, okay. So fast forward when we began food sensitivity testing, lo and behold, almonds popped up, almond flour popped up as this trigger for a great number of my patients. And I went, son of a gun. You know, I, I knew I shouldn't have let people have almonds. Uh, so I, I have a list of the top 12 worst offenders that really surprise people. But almonds are, are number one on the, on the offender list. You know what's wild is, you know, for 10 years I did a ketogenic diet. Right? That's uh, a lot of my channel was built talking about that. And I started noticing that, you know, as more and more keto products came out, we were consuming more and more and more almond flour, right? And I started to notice to a point, I would start feeling foggy. I started recommending on my videos, maybe we should be reducing this almond flour. There's something going on, I can't put my finger on it, but why am I brain foggy every time I have almonds? I've since pretty much eliminated almonds out of my diet just because I, I don't think they're this terrible food, but I just don't feel good. I don't feel good and there's a clear line of how I feel between before eating almonds and after eating almonds. So, you know, it's the same kind of thing for me. <clears throat> Occasionally I'll have some sprouted almonds, but I really try to limit. It's just wild and I almost wonder if all of these almond flour products coming on the market, like people are just consuming so much of them that either now they're noticing it and they didn't notice it before because maybe they weren't consuming as much or B, they're consuming it so much that they're developing issues with it. It's it's kind of bizarre. Yeah, I have a, a woman patient that um, I've written about in the past who, um, who had uh, psoriasis, really massive psoriasis. And we got her off of all of her meds and all of her psoriatic plaques resolved except one spot on her back which is about two inches around and she was really happy she said you know hey you know i don't have it anywhere it's done in my scalp i'm i'm a happy camper but isn't it interesting that i have this one spot and it won't go away and i said well would you mind if we do you know a food sensitivity test and see and so it's a blood test and we sent it off she usually gets the copy before I see her back in this case. And lo and behold, almonds was bright red, that you know, almond flour. And she was making almond flour cookies, almond flour bread, you know, all the time. So she had about two weeks before our next appointment. So she stopped her almond. The other thing she was very sensitive was to vanilla bean. And mm-hmm. vanilla bean pops up all the time in people. So she took away her vanilla extract, which she was using in her almond flour cookies. And by 
So this was two weeks before I see her next. She walks in. She said, You're, you got to look at this. And you know, pulls up her shirt. It's now not two inches, but one inch in, in two weeks. And she says, it was you know the almond flour and the vanilla bean. And I've got an NHL star who was literally dying of Crohn's disease. And, I mean, 20 episodes of bloody diarrhea a day on multiple meds had to got down to 87 pounds and was being cared for by his mother. And they found the Plant Paradox book and got down to about five bowel movements a day, started gaining weight. We did the same tests on him. And sure enough, almond flour and vanilla beans were one of his biggest triggers. Hmm. He's now back playing in the, in the NHL. Holy cow. Just getting rid. And it's like... What the heck? Almond yeah. flour and vanilla extract? And the hilarious thing is, so with those patients, I say, the great news is that imitation vanilla extract is just fine for you to use. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying wow. that, right? <laughs> That's interesting. It's, and I've heard you kind of talk about this before, and it's actually it's made me scratch my head. This is an interesting story. I've always had a big sensitivity to poison oak. Like, always. Very sensitive to it ever since I was a young kid. About four or five years ago, I got a really bad systemic bout of it. Uh, really, really bad. It was in my airway. It was it was really bad. I got one particular patch on my, like, my shin. It was really bad, really deep, really gnarly. Okay, that subsides. It was a miserable like six, eight weeks of not sleeping and whatever. <laughs> anyway, now, this is funny, whenever I have cashews, I can't eat cashews anymore. Whenever I have cashews, this is what's super bizarre the rash comes back and I itch. No one believes me. People think I'm nuts until I literally, no pun intended, will eat cashews and it happens. And so my family's seen it because little things end up in there. Oh, here's a piece of chocolate. Oh, low carb chocolate. Didn't realize it was made with cashew butter. Should have looked. And then I'm like, oh, I'm itching. I'm itching. I'm like, holy cow. The rash is appearing like where I had poison oak and it's, I mean, you can't make that, I guess you could make that stuff up, but that legitimately is happening to me. So I can't touch cashews. It's, yeah, it's, it's the same super, family as poison ivy. Yep. It's, the, it's the same family. Yep. And yeah, it's amazing. I, I was on shows. Uh, there, was a, there was a juice company. The young lady was listening and we were talking and she was a big fan of cashew milk. And she had really bad GI issues. And... So she she gotten rid of dairy and she was using cashew milk and she overheard me saying, man, you know, cashew milk and cashews, if you like swallowing poison ivy, go right ahead. And so she stopped that and I stopped by the studio for some other reason and she grabbed me and she says, it was the cashews. It was the cashews. I, I don't have any issues anymore. You know, how did you know? I said, I didn't know. It's poison ivy. So, yeah. I mean, I think it's true when they harvest those things. They're wearing full gear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's cashew pickers disease. They get burns on their hands. Yeah. And the Amazonian Indians, where cashews originally came from, they always take the cashew nut off and eat the fruit. They, th they throw it away. Wild. Yeah. Eh. They, they give it to us. <laughs> well, so that, is there any anything else you've you've sort of pivoted on uh, in the last five or six years before we wrap this up? Uh, one of the things that I come down really hard on is um, beef, lamb, and pork, and milk that isn't fermented. Um, and I wrote about this in the Plant Paradox. Uh, there is a sugar molecule in beef, lamb, and pork, and milk that is called New 5 capital G-C. It lines the blood vessels of these animals. Uh, it lines it's in the mammary glands of these animals. Uh, we have a very similar molecule that's called New 5 capital A-C. <laughs> New 5 GC and New 5 AC are identical except for one molecule of oxygen. They're otherwise the exact same molecule. They're a sugar molecule, sialic acid. Now, our gut wall has these sugar molecules. The protective layer of our blood vessels, which is called the glycocalyx, and there won't be a test, 
is lined with new 5 ac sugar molecules the blood brain barrier the thing that protects our brain also has a glycocalyx that's made of new 5 ac our joint surfaces are made of new 5 ac unfortunately when we eat new 5 gc it's absorbed and we make an antibody to it an aggressive antibody to it as a foreign substance now i wrote about this in the plant paradox and we know that there's a strong association between red meat eating and coronary artery disease dementia arthritis and cancer strong association association does not mean causation I proposed, and other people proposed, that because these two molecules are so similar, that if we develop antibodies to new 5 gc and we do every time we eat it, then we mistakenly attack new 5 ac because it's so similar. It's molecular mimicry, and that's pretty good. Well, now in this book, the revelation is, here's the bad news. Not only do we make antibodies against new 5 gc But NU5GC, because it's so similar to NU5AC, can substitute for NU5AC in the lining of our blood vessels, in the lining that protects our brain and in our joints. And so we attack the NU5GC that's displaced NU5AC. And the bad news is the more NU5GC we eat, the more we displace NU5AC. Now, the really scary part is that animals hate having new 5GC in their brain, even if they make it, and they actively keep it out because new 5GC is a major cause of neuroinflammation. So now you've got the wall protecting your brain, now made of new 5GC. You attack that, the blood-brain barrier gets broken, and now new 5GC is in your brain, and you actively attack your brain. So it's no longer association. It is now causation. You want the good news? What's the good news? Now, first of all, I have no dog in this fight. I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. Nebraska is the beef state for a reason. I have no dog in this fight. If you ferment milk or if you ferment animal products, for instance, with a sausage, the bacteria or the yeast actually eat the new 5GC and it's gone. So... It turns out that a lot of these long-lived people are actually fermented sheep and goat dairy eaters, and they also are sausage eaters, and the sausage makes it safe. And if you think about it way long time ago, you had no preservation system for meat, so you had to make it into something that was fermented. In fact, fun fact, Prosciutto is loaded with bacteria that are really good for you. And that's what makes prosciutto prosciutto. And it's eaten all the new 5GC. Interesting. And it's, yeah, it's got all those bioactive peptides. And yeah. you look at yeah. all the Mediterranean cultures that eat it. Yeah. And people in America a lot of times say, oh, that's processed meat. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah, here it's processed yeah. meat. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the longest, longest longevity Uh, life expectancy in the world is this little tiny country called Andorra between Spain and France in the Pyrenees Mountains. They have a life expectancy, both men and women, of 90 years. Eh, Pretty good. They're sheep herders and they eat sausage every day. And you go, wait a minute, that's not good for you. And well, they're the longest living people in the world. Interesting. What's their carbohydrate intake, if any? Uh, They mainly subsist on uh, cheeses and meats. Uh, They do eat grains, but um, they're totally different than our grains because they don't have any glyphosate over there. Yeah, I mean, I want to ask you that because I've you talk to people, they go to Europe, they're like, "Hey, I ate bread, I ate, I ate pasta, and I didn't have any issues. I didn't have GI issues. I didn't have brain fog." Like. Clearly, there's something different there. Like yeah. what? What's so? It's what is the? Is there any differences besides the glyphosate? Like, is there anything that? Uh, is there lower levels of gliadin? Is it like what is it? 
No, I, I think um, Dave Asprey might disagree with me. I think the genetic alterations of our wheat um, are, are are too easy because even in Europe, uh, harvesting wheat that's a short stalk is much easier than harvesting wheat that's a tall stalk because it tends to break. And remind me to tell you a funny story about oats if we have the time. Um, so most of the wheat, even grown over in Italy or Ukraine, is now basically the same variety that we do. The difference is that we spray almost all of our grains with glyphosate as a desiccant uh, Roundup. Roundup used to be used for GMO products, but now it's much easier to harvest a field that's dry. And water costs a huge amount of money to carry. And so you're much more efficient if you kill the crop and dry it out and then harvest it. And so factory farms now always spray all their crops with glyphosate to kill it so that they can harvest it on a schedule. So all of our stuff is loaded with glyphosate. And in Europe, it's almost non-existent. Uh, and each year, the bans in Europe get stronger and stronger against glyphosate. So you're right. I have a lot of my patients who their autoimmune disease is gone, their psoriasis is gone, or their Crohn's is gone, and they go over to Europe, and you're right. They go, oh, you know, that croissant looks really good, or wow, that pasta looks really good, and, and they have it. And they go, oh my gosh, this is great news. Dr. Gundry has cured me. <laughs> you know, I can have this stuff. And they come back and they start eating our stuff. They eat the sourdough bread here or they have our pizza. And within two weeks, they're on the phone going, what the heck? You know, my patch on my arm is back or what the heck? My joint hurts. I thought you cured me. I said, I didn't cure you of glyphosate. And it's the dumb glyphosate. <laughs> That's so wild. And I, I didn't forget. So tell us the uh, tell me the oat story. All right. And I talk about this in the book. There's a banned uh, herbicide that is used, I kid you not, to make oak stalks uh, shorter because if it's a short stalk, uh, it doesn't break in the wind. And if it breaks in the wind, you're done. Uh, and so it's totally illegal in this country to use it to retard the growth of oats. But it's not illegal to use in other countries. And um, the EPA set a bare minimum standard that this agent shouldn't you know, be on this. During the former administration's tenure, the EPA was told to loosen the rules for this herbicide. And now all of our oats, including all of our healthy oats like Cheerios and old-fashioned Quaker oats, are loaded with this herbicide, which is banned as unfit for human consumption. Thanks so much for watching this episode, but don't go anywhere. I think you're going to love this next one. Why is he a diabetic? Well, number one, as I've talked about before, uh, oat milk may be one of the most poisonous beverages you can put in your mouth for reasons I've mentioned before, but it is a whole grain. 